Hey, welcome to Follow Me, the online teaching ministry of Wayne Fleet BIC Church in Wayne Fleet, Ontario. We are so pleased and blessed to have you with us during this time. We reach out to across uh, Canada and into the United States and other places. And for wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you watch this, welcome. We are so glad to have you. And we begin a new study today as we talk about suffering. As we look at why do good people suffer and bad things happen to them? Where is God in the suffering? These are all questions that we think about. And, uh, and so we're going to look at uh, what the Bible has to say about it by looking at the life of a guy named Job. So stay with us and uh, let's see if we can learn together. Forty-eight years in church ministry has certainly seen some beautiful body life moments as uh, uh, believers have professed Christ as their Savior, as I've had the privilege of uniting couples in, in marriage, dedicated beautiful babies and children, taking youth, uh, uh, taking youth on mission trips and, and to be able to see their hearts open to the needs of of uh, others less fortunate and the spiritual needs that are in this world. I've had the privilege of leading communion hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of times in the last 48 years. I have had the privilege of baptizing uh, countless followers of Jesus in the last 48 years. And what a blessing that's been and a privilege, these body life rich moments in the church but I've also held the hand of the dying. And I have comforted a uh, family who have, who have lost their loved ones. I've broken the news of tragedy to family. And I've seen couples agonize in their relationships. I've also had spouses who have uh, made poor choices and work through the hurt that they've caused and the pain. I've been able to help the addict get back uh, on their feet to get up off the mat of life. I've comforted the family when suicide has taken a loved one. As a pastor, I'm no stranger to seeing God answer prayer and celebration, but I'm also no stranger to seeing suffering come in the lives of good people. And invariably, whether it's the dreaded news that's, that's delivered by the doctor or a police officer knocking on the door at 2 a.m. or the young person who has abandoned their faith, the common thread of, of question that comes up in all of that is why do good people have bad things happen to them? Why is there this unfair distribution of suffering in the world. And all of us have found ourselves at, at some time asking the question to God, why? What can we learn from scripture? Where is God when people suffer? And can't God see it coming and prevent it if he's so powerful? Well, the goal of this study is not to tie up suffering into a bunch of neat cliches, answers, or or to just somehow tie it up with a, a red bow of, of perfect understanding. Now, if the goal is for us as finite beings to perfectly understand the infinite mind of God, then we are done before we even begin. However, if we can just wrap our finite brain and our heart around suffering and wrestle a bit with God, and maybe with ourselves, 
I think we can learn some valuable truths that will help us in life as we study the book of Job. So, please open your Bibles to probably the most depressing book in the whole Bible, Job chapter 1. Well, let me say this. It, it would be the most depressing book if it were not for the ending. <laughs> Have you ever watched a movie and, and the hero has every unimaginable obstacle that he or she has to hurdle, and at some point you think, oh no, the hero's not going to make it. Well, that's how Job begins, and it moves along for a while, and there are no, pardon the pun, pat answers given in the book of Job. But we can tell you this, Job is a true story. And it takes place in what would today be modern uh, northern Arabia. It was written back in the days of Abraham. He and Abraham would have been contemporaries in the same time. Uh, and the way we know that is there's no reference to Israel uh, or the law uh, that was given uh, to the Jews. So we're figuring somewhere a couple of millennia before Christ. Uh, it is the oldest of the Old Testament books. Job is referenced in Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Paul quotes from it twice. James refers to Job. And Job asks a lot of questions. Uh, 330 questions to be exact. And by comparison, Matthew asks about 150 questions and the Psalms asks about 160 questions. Many think that the theme of Job is to answer why we suffer. But if that's the theme, Job never answers it. Rather, it, it may not be why, but rather how do we suffer? This is a riches to rags uh, front of the story, and it begins in chapter 1, and we see there in verses 1 to 3 that there's this guy named Job. He lives in the land of Uz. He was a blameless guy, meaning he wasn't perfect. It just meant that he, he was a man of great integrity. He feared God, and, and he stayed away from evil. And he had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 1,000 donkeys, 500 female donkeys, and he also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person um, in his era of life. He, he would be um, um, the Bill Gates of today, you know. And so um, Job was this guy who had the world by the tail. He was a, a good, even godly guy. And he had 10 kids. Uh, they were family that loved each other. They liked being together. Again, this guy was wealthy and rich. Had a, he had a, a wonderful marriage. He was healthy, full of life, very grateful in his life. Job teaches us some spiritual realm things that we need to know as followers of Jesus. And that is simply... Number one, there is a spiritual realm around us. We see this in the book of Job because we're privy to some things that Job wasn't privy to at the time. And we see in chapter 1, beginning with verse 6, One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. And Satan answered uh, the Lord. I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. And then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Verse 9, Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You've always put a wall of protection. Your translation may, may say hedge of protection around him and his home and his property. You've made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. 
All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Now we, the readers, we're, we're given info that Job did not have. He did not know that God was using him to refute Satan's lies. Uh, he had to take his trials in faith. He didn't understand what was going on. He did not know that Satan had accused Job of being in it for the blessings. And that is exactly uh, what he infers in the passage of Scripture. Satan was lying to God and, and again, just saying, Job's in it for the blessings. Job would not be so righteous if he only obeyed and served God for the goodies. So it does beg a good question here. So do we expect God to give us a hall pass from suffering if we serve him or if we're good people and if we treat every person right? And, and do, do we expect God to give us a hall pass that we can bypass suffering? Well, I would say that's not our best motive for loving God and serving Him because bad things do happen to good people. Something the prosperity preachers neglect to preach, and I would say dishonestly so. Um, serve God and you'll be healthy, wealthy, and blessed with good luck, you know. This would be easier to grasp if Job had been a, a murdering terrorist like Saddam Hussein or or Bin Laden, or, or, or some despot like Stalin or Hitler, or in today's world, uh, Putin in Russia. Bad things should happen to bad people, right? Yet, we're reading just the opposite happen here. And so in chapter 2, um, Satan lies to God again and accuses Job of favoring his health over uh, following God. And so Satan steals his health from him. And he'd already lost his family. He'd already lost his wealth. And now he was losing his health. And on the outside, nothing good could be seen. Uh, the Bible says in chapter 7 and verse 5 that maggots were eating in his sores. Uh, chapter 7 verse 14 talks about the nightmares, the night terrors that he was having when he slept. In chapter 7 and verse 30, his very bones ached. In chapter 30 and verse 30, it talks about how his skin dried up and how feverish he was. By chapter 2 and verse 8, his grief-stricken wife who suffered the same losses, except she didn't lose her health, she lets go of hope and, and faith and spirals into despair and says to her husband, hey, why don't you just curse God and die? And she says this to him as he's laying in the trash burning pit, sitting among the warm ashes to find relief from the sores that he had broken out with. And he was taking pieces of old pottery and scraping his sores to find relief. How had it come to this? What had he done? Where was God? in all of this, right? Questions Job or us cannot answer. But, but watch this. A as we close out this message, why cannot be answered well by us? Because we're finite. We, we don't have the infinite view that God does. But Job does answer how we should suffer. And that's the second point. That is, worship and trusting God is sometimes all that we can do. He was flailing in a, in a sea of grief and loss. It was horrific loss. And he was alone now. His wife was drowning in her own grief and pain and, and lashing out to him. Yet Job worshipped God, whom seemed so far away from him. Yet Job had come to trust in his track record. He says in chapter 2 and verse 10, Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? That word bad doesn't mean sinful or evil. It means bad in the sense of uh, uncomfortable or 
or a loss, you know, that type of thing. So all in, so in all of this, the Bible says, Job said nothing. Uh, back in chapter 1, in verse 20, when he found out he had lost his kids and, and he had lost all of his wealth, the Bible says in verse 20, Job stood up and tore his robe in grief, and then he shaved his head and he fell to the ground to worship. He fell to the ground to worship. In verse 21 there in chapter 1, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had. By the way, that's easy for us to say. You know, hey, God gave me this. God did this for me. God's done this. God answered this prayer. That, that's easy to say. But notice then what he says. The Lord gave me what I had. The Lord has taken it away. Now that's harder to say, isn't it? And then he says, praise the name of the Lord. And I will tell you this morning, only by faith can something like that be said. Verse 22 goes on to say, in all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. That word blame means literally charge God with wrongdoing. He's, it, the Bible says, in all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. He didn't shake the fist at God. He had plenty of questions, but he didn't shake the fist. He worshiped. He didn't look defiant to heaven. He looked prayerful and worshipful toward heaven. And so may I invite you into the mystery of God this morning. I wanna invite you wherever you are today watching this and, and whoever you are, and whatever you're going through in your life right now, I want to invite you into the mystery of God. And I want to invite you to bow the knee and not shake the fist when life does not make sense. But rather, can you worship God for who He is? And can you trust God even when you don't have the answers? And can you trust God even when you have a lot of questions and you're saying why? We need to operate from the point that God is God. My finite mind does not understand His infinite mind. But this we know, God is good. Just as our kids, when they were toddlers, did not understand us as parents, what we, what we did for them, decisions we made on their behalf, some of those decisions didn't make sense to their little minds. Some of the decisions we made were uncomfortable for their lives because we were looking out for their best or there was a bigger picture in play in being able to, to help our kids. And so God is good. And we operate from the premise that He loves us. So even when He does not make sense, we can trust God and worship even with our questions and broken hearts. This is the same God of John 3.16, where the Bible says that God gave His one and only Son to heal humanity's brokenness. And He did that because He loves us. And so we may not always understand where He's coming from or what the purpose is, but we can always trust His heart. And that is exactly what Job is saying today, that he trusted God, he worshiped God, even with all of his questions, even with all of his discouragement, even when he was looking for answers. And I wanna encourage you as we begin this study, there's no neat cliches, there's no red ribbon that will put a nice bow on this thing of suffering but we can submit our finite minds to the infinite mind and heart of God and trust Him. And I pray that you will. For some of you, faith is something that maybe is kind of new or you're dipping your toe back in the water of faith. And I would say for some people that are watching this that maybe your hesitancy is because you've just not understand why God allows the things that He allows, that is He not in control? Does He not care? Can I say today, hang in there with us. 
I hope that you'll follow along in this study of Job because there's some things we can learn. There's some things we can wrestle with. There's some things that we can, that we can ask. God's got big shoulders. We can ask questions. We can ask why. But when it's all said and done, I pray when this study is done that we will understand the mind of God a wee bit better. And I hope that this study will be such a help to you in your faith and walk with God. Thanks for being with us today on Follow Me. Until next time, I'm Pat Hammond.